quite a, that's maybe a bit of a simplification, but generally speaking, the faster growing the trees are, the more carbon they will absorb. And you just have to look at uh, the, uh, the, the, the amount of timber that will be produced uh, by uh, a, 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 a broadleaf, low yield class uh, native broadleaf plantation, for example, that's being planted now in comparison to a yield class 20 Sitka spruce or Douglas fir woodland. And you can see that the, uh, the uh, differences in the amount of carbon that might be sequestered in that short time scale are absolutely immense. Now, the current additionality rules, the financial additionality rules within the Woodland Carbon Code make that scenario of uh, having carbon units attributed to high yielding conifer, uh, productive conifer woodlands, uh, they make that really quite difficult. And one of the subjects that we hope we'll discuss today is uh, will, will, that, uh, will that additionality criteria change? Has the market changed? Uh, in the past, it could be argued that carbon trading uh, very much relied on the sort of feel good factor uh, for firms buying carbon units. It could also be argued that the present and future markets may well be uh, determined by the, the, the recognized ex existential risk that we all face from climate change. So I think there's been a, a dramatic change in the markets, which now require huge numbers of carbon units in the shortest possible time scale. So the current review uh, being carried out by the WCC on additionality is really quite important. So here to hopefully shed some light on uh, the subject are uh, Andy Baker, who's the Woodland Carbon Markets Advisor for Scottish Forestry, so very strongly linked to the, the Woodland Carbon Code. Uh, Max Hislop, who's the Director of Clyde Climate Forest, and hopefully uh, Max will explain to us what climate, uh, uh, what the, the Clyde Climate Forest is all about and how carbon might be related to that initiative. And then we'll hear from Robert Scott Dempster, uh, Robert is a uh, partner and head of land and rural business at uh, Gillespie McAndrew Solicitors and, and, and Robert will hopefully explain to us uh, some of the uh, issues which might be involved in the sort of long term agreements uh, that, uh, that have to be entered into when, when uh, uh, trading carbon. Uh, what effect might that have on forest owners? What are the long term commitments? What are the effects on title? That sort of thing. We'll have a question and answer session at the end of the three presentations. Um, and uh, please do feel free, as Jamie said, to uh, put any questions into the chat room there. Uh, if I could now pass over to Andy Baker and ask Simon Franks, please, to turn your camera off. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Uh, thanks a lot, Raymond, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, I know it's a really topical subject at the minute, and so I hope to shed some light on the reasoning behind the changes that are needed and um, what's brought us to this position. So, as Raymond has said, my name is Andrew Baker. I work for the work for Scottish Forestry, but Woodland Carbon Code is actually governed by Scottish Forestry. So there's only three of us in the team and we govern the Woodland Carbon Code for the whole of the UK. Um, so I thought I've got 15, 20 minutes to go through stuff, except for the Q&A at the end. So I just thought I'd break down what I'm going to cover and I hope it's applicable to everyone here. Now, most of us, if not all of us, know what the Woodland Carbon Code is, but I'm going to give a very, very quick introduction as to what it is and where it's used talk a little bit about how much money can be made and the current market where that's sitting, a bit about eligibility of projects going into the Woodland Carbon Code, looking at the key principles behind carbon offsetting generally, internationally, and what we have to adhere to, looking at additionality specifically, then looking at something that I like to think of as a sliding scale of additionality, but I'll come on to that later on, and then looking at what proposed changes we're making and looking at what our options are and why we've chosen these proposed changes um, and also a bit of a review as to what we've done to get ourselves to this point. It hasn't been a snap decision by any means. 
So first and foremost, what is the Woodland Carbon Code? As I say, I'll just fly through this. So it is essentially a UK government backed standard for Woodland Carbon projects, allows for the generation of carbon units, which allows both companies and the UK government to be able to make claims of carbon neutrality. Oh. Now, that just gives you a bit of an idea as to the different types of claims that can be made. And all of these mean different things. And so when you hear different companies making such claims, it can be very difficult to actually know what they're saying. Um, but through schemes like ours, they can verify legally that they can make these claims. And then next of all, looking at the generation of credits, one credit equates to one tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent, the equivalent including gases like methane, nitrous oxide, that sort of thing. And we have two different types of units, pending issuance units and carbon units. And the claims that you can make upon the purchase of those differ quite significantly. I'll come on to that in a sec. And as I said before, we're governed by Scottish Forestry. We're supported by research from Forest Research, NRW, Forestry Commission, and the well, uh, the I Northern Irish guys, they're all on board as well. And we are endorsed by ECROA, the International Carbon Reduction and Offset Alliance, which is hugely important in credibility of the Woodland Carbon Code and the offset units that we provide. So quickly looking at PIUs versus WCUs. So woodlands take time to grow, as we all know. And so if you were to plant a hectare of woodland and say, all right, that's sequestered 500 tonnes of carbon dioxide, that's obviously nonsense. The trees haven't grown yet. And so we assign two different types of units, PIUs, pending issuance units, and WCUs, wooden carbon units. So when you plant a woodland, let's say you planted a mixed broadleaf woodland, one hectare, and it was a non-intervention woodland, and you said over 100 years, this is going to sequester 500 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. We would assign you a validation. So once you've planted and just had all your paperwork checked, we'd assign you 500 PIUs. You can then sell them to companies and they will buy those units to become carbon neutral in the future. Over time, through verifications every 10 years, those PIUs, if everything goes according to plan, will convert into WCUs, so woodland carbon units, highlighting the fact that that carbon has been locked in to the biomass of the tree and the soil. So you start the project with 500 PIUs and no WCUs, and then by the end of the project, they will all have evolved into 500 WCUs and no PIUs. And as I said before, the important difference between them is what companies can base based upon them. And so if I was a company and I had 500 tonnes of CO2 E emissions annually and I bought 500 woodland carbon units, I could say our company this year is carbon neutral. Whereas if I bought 500 pending issuance units, all I could say is we are working towards carbon neutrality. So you can see how enormous that difference is for companies. So that's the main difference between them. Now moving swiftly on, how much money can be made? I won't go through all the processes involved in that sort of thing because you don't need to know that just now. How much can be made? So prices at the moment are anywhere between six to 25 pounds plus per tonne per unit. And you can generate anywhere between 100 units per hectare to 500 units per hectare based on a variety of factors, yield class being an enormous one of them, management regime, soil preparation technique, that sort of thing, all having big factor, being big factors on the amount of units generated per hectare. So just scaling that up, you're looking at anywhere between 600 to 12 and a half thousand pounds per hectare. Now that's just a one off, that, that can be in a variety of ways, but I'll come on to that in a sec. The main factors affecting the price that you get, so I've already touched on the factors affecting the number of units generated, but the price is based on six main factors. First of all, the location. If it's next to this, it's in the centre of London or it's in the centre of Edinburgh, it's going to have a lot of interest from businesses who wanted to put their sign on it and say that is our wooden creation scheme. Secondly, the nature of the project. So if it's a mixed broadly scheme, some companies want that. Other companies that have timber in their production line, they'll say, well, we want to incorporate a commercial scheme to show that life cycle element of woodland creation and timber production. Next of all, the vintage of the units. So those units, those 500 PIUs that you generate in year one, all have an individual serial number. And we can predict at what point in time moving forwards, each of those units will convert into WCUs, not as a whole, purely that unit will convert by 2030 into a WCU. Companies are far more interested in buying 
carbon units that are or PIUs that are expected to convert into WCUs more quickly because they can make their claims of carbon neutrality more quickly. And so if you have some carbon units that are, uh, you've got 100 carbon units that are going to convert between uh, before 2030, they're likely going to be a lot more value uh, valuable than 10,000 units that are likely to be converting in 2120. So it's very important to know the distinction between them. Next of all, the flexibility of the landowner, the more flexible they are with the company, if they're happy for them to come on site and stuff, they're more likely to generate higher prices. The stage of the project, whether it's pre-planting, post-planting, different companies want different things. And then the associated benefits. Now we judge this based on our Woodland Benefits tool. And so throughout your project design document and your validation process, you can choose to rate your woodland out of five for each of these. And so your wooden carbon units can almost be a wooden carbon unit plus or your PIUs can be PIU plus in the sense that you say not only is it good for sequestering carbon, but it's also fantastic for water, wildlife, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So looking at the different ways in which you can sell very quickly, you can sell both PIUs and WCU. I'll bring all of this up because I always um, repeat myself as I do this. So you can sell both PIUs and WCUs in any quantity that you want at any time. So you could sell out of those 500 that you've generated, you could sell 10 as you start and then sell 100 the next day and then wait for another 50 years to sell any more. Um, it depends on the vintage, as I described before, which ones you're selling. You have to determine these are the ones that I'm selling to you. You can sell to anybody looking to offset their UK based emissions. They can be, people are becoming more innovative now with the way they buy their carbon units. They're not simply saying, I'm just gonna buy all of your carbon units for 10 grand. They're saying, right, I'll pay you 150 pounds per hectare per year for the next 20 years, and I will get your carbon right. So all of the carbon coming off that land, I will generate. Automated sales is something we're trying to facilitate because the sales process at the minute is quite clunky at the end of the day. And so we're trying to make it so that there's a possibility in the future of, of buyers being able to go onto a registry and say, right, we want to buy 10 units that are, that are WCUs at this price. And it just automates that sale. You can bundle or stack with other credits and grants, so long as you pass additionality. And then the Wooden Carbon Guarantee is purely based in England, and that is essentially the government promise that we will buy a proportion of your units, for, well, all of your units, sorry, from a project for an agreed upon price. It's a reverse auction process, but again, I'm not going to go into that now. The next auction for that is sometime um, in 2022, um, mid, early to mid 2022. So next of all, looking at the current market, so how many projects we've got and that sort of thing. So very, very quickly. So this map is a, a bit out of date actually, because I've, that's not my to-do list. But we have now nearly 1,200 projects registered with the Woodland Carbon Code, 309 of which have validated and so planted and gone through that process. We've got 45,000 hectares nearly of new woodland creation, 16,000 of which has been validated, and that's expected to sequester a lot of carbon dioxide over 100 years and that just gives you an idea as to how many units are on the market all of those are PIUs there are about 800 WCUs available so it just shows you how when these companies are coming forward and saying we want to buy 10,000 WCUs we can't accommodate that so the Woodland Carbon Code um, that the trees are going to take a lot longer. By the time we get to 2025, 2030, that proportion will go up quite significantly. But for now, we don't have many WCUs. Eligibility, and then we'll be going on to additionality in just a moment. So eligibility is only for new wooden creation, so not restocking or anything like that. There's no minimum or maximum area, although obviously economies of scale, you've got a far better chance of making it worth your while if it's a bigger project. It can include natural regeneration, um, hedgerows aren't included, but there are different organisations looking at making a hedgerow carbon code at the minute. So watch that space and it must be additional. So here we come. So the key principles of carbon offsetting schemes internationally. So this includes solar generation, peatland restoration, direct air capture and of course woodland creation. It needs to be measurable. So you need to be able to quantify the emissions reduction or removal from the atmosphere. Secondly, it needs to be permanent. Now, there are a lot of different opinions on what permanent means. At the minute, the international consensus seems to be 100 years. And so our projects can run up to 100 years, and that seems to be okay. There are movements to start saying it needs to be looking at geological 
timescales, thousands of years rather than just 100 years. And so if we were to try to say, right, we've sequestered a ton of carbon for carbon dioxide for 100 years, they would say, OK, well, that's one tenth of a unit if it's out of a 1000 year geological timeline rather than a whole unit. So that is something to watch. I don't think that's likely to develop much further than that, but I might be wrong. Um, next of all, it has to be verifiable and it needs to be able to be monitored as time goes on. Um, and so there's a big issue there with soil. It's quite hard to actually measure accurately how much carbon is increasing in the soil or far easier with biomass, far easier with a tree. But again, we have challenges with root biomass and that sort of thing too. So it is a bit of a challenge but you can generally verify that woodland is alive and kicking. And then finally, it needs to be additional. And I'll come on to that in a minute. All of these make it credible. Now, that is hugely important. Buyers won't buy carbon units if they're not credible. And that this is what the bigger companies in particular, the ones that are a bit more savvy and know the carbon market now, they're asking for credibility every single time. And most of you will know this, but there may be disagreements as to what makes a credible unit. So coming on to additionality itself. So the principle of additionality, now this was set back in Kyoto 10 years ago. And just to, to start, I am by no means an authority on the international measures that were taken about additionality. All I know is how it applies to the carbon code. And I've got a fair understanding of the reasoning behind it, but I would never claim to be perfect. And the difficulty with additionality is it can be quite subjective. It is fiendishly difficult to to actually determine whether something is additional or not because of a variety of factors. Most importantly, you're kind of working off of hypothetical baseline scenarios. I'll come on to that now, but I just wanted to preface things with I'm um, take what I say with a pinch of salt. First and foremost, additionality is based on the principle that the net greenhouse gas emission savings or sequestration are over and above those that would have arisen anyway. And this is a fundamentally important part. Now, many of you may disagree and say every single tree that's planted in the UK is an additional tree that wasn't there before. That's fine. But even if I did agree with that, which I kind of don't, I do get the point, but I don't really agree with that. It's beyond us. If we want to say that we are a credible carbon standard, there's no way that we could make that statement and, and that stand up. Next of all, um, the underlying rationale behind this is essentially if you're already going to be planting the woodland, then the business investing in that woodland through the purchase of carbon credits, it's not facilitating any change. Think of it as a facilitation mechanism. That's what the carbon code is there for. I've heard a lot of people describe it as, oh, it allows you to calculate the amount of carbon that's sequestered through your wooden creation scheme. That is absolutely not correct. That isn't what we're there for. We're a facilitation mechanism to ensure that the private finance coming into the wooden creation unlocks wooden creation that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Next of all, it's very difficult to do, as I said before, because you have to define this business as usual baseline of would it have happened anyway? And that's an incredibly difficult question. To. And just to give you an idea, there are over 15 different types of test for testing for additionality um, and they cover a variety of different things and most of them will apply to woodland creation. Not all of them do, but most of them do. So we only actually focus on three of those and kind of only two of those to be quite honest so we could broaden our spec quite significantly into including a lot more different tests for additionality um, but we don't so first of all we've got the legal test so as all of you will know that is essentially asking the question is there a legal requirement to plant those trees in that place namely restocking isn't it doesn't pass legal test you have to do it legally and then secondly, looking at compensatory planting. If you built a road and cleared a hectare of woodland and had to plant a hectare elsewhere, a legal requirement, you're gonna do it anyway. So private investment won't make any difference as to whether that goes ahead or not. Secondly, and the controversial one is the financial test. Now that's asking from an economic perspective, does it make sense to plant that woodland in that place? It's very, very difficult to judge that, but we have to do it. So we're in a very, very difficult position because if we just say, actually, no, we're not going to bother with it. It's too complicated. Then our units are no longer credible. So we have to do it in some way. And the issue of the minute is our current rules 
around additionality and our current cash flow, which is what we base it on. So essentially project developers can input costs, income over the course of their project. And we come up with a net present value discounted back. And based on the current rules that we have, those figures can be manipulated quite easily for a scheme that all of us here would know would 100% go ahead. It's 80% SICA, it's 100% grant funded. Why would you not plant there? It can make those sort of schemes seem non-additional, well, sorry, seem additional, but seem like non-economically viable based on the manipulation of the figures because we don't have very firm rules in place to say what you can and can't do. Therefore, we're proposing some changes. I'll come on to that in a minute as to what those changes are. And then finally, we look at the barrier test. Now, the barrier test is generally used in developing countries and it's less to do with economics because the economics for a scheme may make sense. It may stack up to plant a scheme in a foreign, in a developing country. And you could say, well, then clearly it's not additional. Yeah, but if you use a barrier test there, there's terrorism, there's war, there's political instability. That is where the barrier test is generally used. We do have it in the carbon code. But as far as I'm aware, I think it's been used maybe once in the last 12 years. So it really is rarely used and it's not generally designed for developed countries. It's more for those developing countries, as I said. Now, coming on to the financial test. Uh, but before I do that, actually, I wanted just to touch on this sliding scale of additionality. Now, I like to think of it in this way because additionality, you think it's either yes or no. As I say, it seems objective. Like, is it additional or not? Are you going to plan there or not? But there are varying degrees, as I say, based on that variety of tests that you've got. 15 plus there are varying, varying degrees of additionality for instance we're, well we're constantly trying to find this balance when we're looking at additionality um to well, i'll come on to that in a second so when i look when i talk about the varying degrees of additionality we can make it very strict and we can say look if any woodland has a grant scheme then it's probably going to go ahead anyway so we're just going to say that it's not additional that is the stance that a lot of international schemes take. Some schemes internationally say it's not allowed any timber revenue because that clearly is an economical gain. And so some schemes want to be the absolute airtight. There's no way on earth that this project would have gone ahead without our funding. Whereas there are the other extreme where they say, I don't really care. It was definitely going to go ahead, but we're going to give you carbon units anyway. So we've got to find a place at the carbon code that we're comfortable with that is stringent enough to keep out the vast majority of schemes that obviously will go ahead, even if we let a few of them slide through, whilst not um, disincentivizing the schemes that do need the money, but because of our really strict rules, we're not allowing them to enter the carbon code. So it's a really fine balancing act. Now, the changes that we're proposing, all carbon standards have this issue at some point in their development. Basically, we have the choice to be able to make it a project specific approach. So when the code came into its existence 10 years ago, we could say to people, right, give us all of the finances associated with your wooden creation scheme and we will go through them and see whether it's additional or not. And they could take a very specific labor intensive project based approach. Over time, you can't really do that because you don't have the resources to do it as for, for one. And so you then start looking at a more generalized approach. And the benefit of that generalized approach and that consistent approach is it allows you to predict moving forwards whether your scheme is likely to be additional. If we just said, yeah, plant your scheme up with 80% SICA and once you come to validation post planting, we'll do a very project specific approach. You don't really know based on our rules whether you'd be able, you would pass that additionality. Whereas if we make it consistent, every scheme adheres to these rules, you can see, right, OK, well, based on their rules, I don't think it's correct, but based on their rules, I'm going to pass additionality or not. It allows that predictability, which is really helpful, or so I'm told, for investors when they're looking at wooden creation schemes. So next of all, just looking at the proposed changes we're going to make. I'm aware of time, so I won't take too much longer. First of all, looking at the exclusion of purchase price and residual land value in our cash flow. Now, if you are au fait with the carbon code carbon cash flow calculator, you can see that if you put a purchase price in in year one, and then you put a, um, a sale price of that same value in year 100 and discount it back at 3% even, you're looking at 55,000 pounds of income by that point. So you've got a million pounds of cost and 55,000 pounds worth of income, even if you sell it for a million pounds at that point. So 
including purchase price is very, very tricky. And so we're wanting to use income foregone as a proxy for that. And the benefit of that is it means that existing landowners don't get disadvantaged because they're not selling their land. And so we've also considered the flip saying that why can't existing landowners have an opportunity cost and the residual land value. But in practice, we found it's incredibly difficult to actually work out what the land purely based on the woodland not including any of the other options around you know potentially you could have a hydroelectric scheme on the land you could have um, a housing development whatever it may be it's incredibly difficult to value that land particularly for some of these smaller projects so that's what we're looking at doing next is we're looking at setting or capping the discount rate um, because at the minute you can put the discount rate higher than the three percent template and that obviously if you put in timber income at year 45 and it is making you not additional because the timber income is so high you can push up your discount rate and that means that it's possible that it's going to look additional but we're trying to include some sort of risk factor make it not just a we're going to set it at three percent but that's got work to be done on it Next of all, we're going to look at standardizing certain figures because, again, you can manipulate these figures very easily to make your additionality cash flow work, including income foregone. And we're basing that on the farm business survey data. Timber price, basing that on the standing sale index, because, again, if you just said, well, in year 45, we're going to sell our timber, but we're only going to get five pounds per tonne for it. Well, then it makes it look additional because you're barely getting any money. So economically, it doesn't make sense to do. So that's another thing we're looking at standardizing the carbon price now this is less relevant because the carbon price doesn't really affect your additionality calculator but it does affect the transparency of how much carbon income you're likely to get in comparison to timber grants or the source of income and so we want to set that carbon price so people can't manipulate it and say oh, i'm going to get 100 pounds per ton for carbon and make that carbon income seem really important to the scheme when in reality they're only expecting 10 pounds per ton and then finally, we're wanting to just improve the guidance generally, make all of this clear from the start. So before you've even bought the land, you can see what the rules are and you can plan accordingly. Now, one thing I'd really want to say is it sounds a lot of people feel as though we're disincentivizing commercial schemes because of this. And of course, we are to a degree, because if it's already commercially viable, then you, when we're saying you no longer need carbon money, then obviously that's um, disadvantaging you. But I wouldn't look at it necessarily as a commercial Sitka scheme versus a broadleaf scheme or something like that. A lot of those commercial, those broadleaf schemes generate a huge amount of other income from philanthropic sources, from charitable donations, from biodiversity credits. They have to be declared. So a lot of these mixed broadleaf schemes that are coming through thinking, oh, it doesn't affect me because I'm a mixed broadleaf scheme. They're in for a real shock when we say to them, no, you have to declare all that other income and you're not additional. You can't generate carbon units. And that is happening already. So just to make it clear that we're not being one side or the other. And finally, with the commercial schemes, there's always the option to reduce your grant support. If you do that, that is a huge injection of income in year one that will make you look not additional. If you instead reduce your grant income down, it serves two purposes. First of all, it allows you to generate carbon units on your wooden creation scheme. And secondly, it reduces the burden on the public purse. So that is the direction of travel we're looking at going. And then just as a final slide, looking at the options moving forwards. So first and foremost, this is the stuff that we've done so far to get to where we are at the minute. First of all, we've conducted a huge internal review and summarized all our findings and presented these findings to the executive and advisory boards of the Woodland Carbon Code. We've also created an additionality stakeholder and great engagement group, which I know a lot of you here are part of, to discuss this. We've also commissioned an independent review, which we're currently waiting on the results on. And we have liaised over the last six, 12 months with numerous investment advisors, landowners, corporate buyers to ask their opinion on the proposed changes. So essentially, we've got three options at this point, looking at it quite facetiously in a way. These are the main three options that are that we have at the code. Number one, we can scrap additionality. Why do we need it? We don't need it. We're just going to say every tree planted is additional in our mind. Um, the result of that is the buyers won't be interested because the units aren't credible and the UK government are most likely to say well, you can't do it. We, we probably couldn't do that, but just to say the most extreme option. Next of all, we could refine the additionality tests to make them more robust without going too extreme, which is what we're doing. And then thirdly, we could just red list any project with any supplementary income like other schemes do internationally and i just want to make clear that that is still an option and i'm not in any way an advocate for it 
But a lot of people are saying, well, can't we just red list any Sitka scheme if it has more than 20 percent Sitka? Now, a lot of you here know that I'm a massive fan of commercial forestry, and so I wouldn't want that to happen at all. But this is where we need to come to a compromise and we have to realise that these are genuine options on the table. And so we need to reach that compromise as to what is a realistic and fair option for everyone. And that's me. So I'll pass, pass back to you now, Raymond. I've gone way over time, so I do apologise to Max um, after me, but I'll pass back to you. Andre, thanks. Thanks very much indeed. That was uh, that, that was fascinating and I'm sure there will be some questions at the uh, at the end uh, for you. Um, if, I, if I could now uh, hand over to Max Hislop, uh, Director of Clyde Climate Forest. Uh, Max, look forward to hear what you have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Raymond. Thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, present uh, this afternoon on the Cloud Climate Forest. I'm uh, just going to bring up my presentation. So uh, hopefully you can see my slides now. And uh, what we're seeing here is the uh, eight leaders of the eight councils that make up Glasgow City Region. And they were all very happy to come out and be photographed with either a tree or spade or leaflet in hand at their inaugural tree plantings last uh, last winter for the Clyde Climate Forest. Um, I guess Max, I, I don't know whether I'm alone, but I, I cannot hear you and, I, and it looks like your um, uh, your microphone's muted. OK, my apologies, everyone. Yes, my microphone was muted, so I'll start again <laughs> once more with feeling. So um, what you're seeing here is the a picture of the eight leaders of the councils that make up Glasgow City Region. And uh, last winter, they were all photographed uh, planting trees in their inaugural tree planting projects uh, to, to launch the Clyde Climate Forest. In fact, the Clyde Climate Forest was officially launched on the 1st of June this year. And I guess in Glasgow City Region, with the run up to COP starting next week, it's not surprising uh, that uh, the leaders of the region were so enthusiastic to be associated with a project like this. But it is great that we've got such uh, strong endorsement from our political leaders within, within Glasgow City Region. I suppose an additional reason as to why, um, why the leaders might be interested in the Clyde Climate Forest is the range of benefits that they recognise come from uh, an afforestation project at scale like the Clyde Climate Forest. Clearly, it helps them to say that they are uh, addressing climate change, the climate emergency, also a response to the ecological crisis that we're all uh, facing. But equally, it, uh, it ticks the box in terms of green recovery and the uh, employment and business opportunities associated with the uh, uh, wider uh, afforestation and improvement to the places where people live, placemaking agenda and all the uh, health and well-being uh, benefits that come associated with that. So politicians like this kind of uh, kind of project. They also like um, the headline. The headline for Clyde Climate Forest is that we're looking to plant 18 million trees over the next decade. And conveniently, that amounts to 10 trees for every man, woman and child that lives within Glasgow City region. But uh, crucially, we haven't just plucked that number out of the, the air. It wasn't uh, configured because of the 1.8 million people that live in our region uh, and therefore giving them 10 trees each. It was uh, it's really based on Scottish Government's climate change plan. And it just so happens that it works out at 10 trees per person uh, in the region. It isn't a numbers game. It's about, as we all like to say, planting the right trees in the right places and additionally, for the right reasons. And so we've constructed the Clyde Climate Forest around what we call the three C's, a canopy, connectivity and carbon. 
obviously carbon is the uh, the point of interest for this afternoon's discussion, but I will uh, briefly just show you a little bit about the canopy and connectivity elements of, of our project. The canopy element is about increasing tree canopy in the urban parts of Glasgow City Region. Connectivity is about linking up our woodland uh, habitats, our forest and woodland habitats to allow uh, species to migrate through the region. And then of course, carbon is about uh, taking advantage of growing trees to lock up our atmospheric emissions. So where is the Clyde Climate Forest? Well, you can see and set in the uh, image of Scotland there, Glasgow city region. It's made up of the eight council areas that I already uh, uh, indicated. And here you can see a diagram of our region with the River Clyde running through it uh, down into the, the south of South Lanarkshire. Uh, the dark green area uh, indicates the uh, conurbation of Glasgow. So when it comes to the canopy element, we're looking to uh, plant trees in the urban part of, uh, of the region. Uh, something in the order of about one and a half million trees uh, will be required in order to bring about the targets of uh, canopy cover that we're looking to achieve. When it comes to connectivity, it's very much about targeting tree planting in very specific locations to uh, connect up our existing woodland habitat networks. And uh, in doing so, we're looking to create this migratory corridor from the southern uplands in the south of our region through to the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park to the north of our region. And that work has been based on uh, some excellent analysis undertaken for us by forest research. And then when it comes to carbon, it is really about that, that major expansion of uh, forests and woodlands in our region. We're talking about a doubling of the rate of woodland planting, the current rate of woodland planting within our region uh, over the next 10 years in order to reach our targets. So just looking at each one of those a bit more individually, this is a very recent output based on some uh, analysis we commissioned of aerial photography to count the tree canopy in our urban areas. And what we're looking at here is Glasgow City Council area. And uh, this image shows the percentage of canopy cover for different neighborhoods across Glasgow City Council. And you can see in the center of the image there, that's Glasgow City uh, Center, very low canopy cover, as you might expect in that highly urbanized part of, uh, of the conurbation, but varying degrees of canopy cover uh, in other parts. We're looking to target neighborhoods which are, have current low canopy cover, and, but also are vulnerable to the impacts of, of climate change. And uh, we have some good data to uh, help us focus in on particular uh, locations where we can do that. So we'll be working with communities in these areas which are vulnerable, but also have low canopy cover to improve their resilience in the face of climate change. When it comes to the connectivity, as I mentioned, we had some great analysis undertaken for us by Forest Research, which identifies our existing uh, woodland habitat networks. And that's what you can see uh, in the dark green. And you can see how it stretches down the Clyde Corridor to the south. And then the, the green, light green dots are uh, 100 or so uh, locations, which are key locations for, for stitching back together our woodland habitat networks. Now, these kind of woodlands are likely to be uh, quite small uh, to achieve what we're looking to achieve. They could be within a larger uh, woodland expansion, but these locations are quite targeted and it will be interesting to see what the reaction is of landowners in those areas to, to fulfilling what we're trying to achieve in due course. Uh, as I already mentioned, the, the other part of this is that we're looking to create this migratory corridor. Obviously, as the climate changes, species are generally having to migrate north uh, in order to survive. And if we don't provide them with the, the uh, escape route, if you like, the, the connected highway to, to make that uh, migration, then they're going to be in danger of perishing. And then finally, and I suppose most importantly for this uh, discussion this afternoon, our final element is about carbon. And here we've got an image taken from the uh, Clyde Plan Forest and Woodland Strategy, which was uh, recently uh, approved and uh, it identifies the potential and preferred areas for, for uh, woodland expansion within the region. And within the, that document, it recognizes that, uh, that there's uh, potential for increasing woodland cover in the area by 9,000 hectares. And that would amount to a 3% increase in forest cover. And that aligns with Scottish Government's climate change plan. 
So that is the opportunity, I suppose, for our region. So, as I say, the opportunity is about delivering on the ambitions of Scottish Government's climate change, where it states that they're looking to increase woodland cover across Scotland by 3% by 2032. This is the cover of the uh, forest and woodland strategy. You see that the Clyde Climate Forest logo is uh, on the cover of that because that's a crucial part of the strategy. So on the one hand, we've got councils like Glasgow City Council that's uh, setting targets for carbon neutrality by 2030. And on the other hand, within the strategy, uh, it talks about the amount of emissions that are being uh, put into the atmosphere by uh, within the region. That amounts to 11 million tonnes of carbon dioxide per annum, uh, uh, roughly at the moment. And that we need to be being more fuel efficient and substituting fossil fuels for, uh, for renewables. But that ultimately, we're going to have to deal with our residual emissions. And that tree planting or peatland restoration, I suppose, are the two key tools that we can use to help that come about if we're going to meet net zero. So organisations within our region, like the, the University of Glasgow, have been uh, developing climate change strategies. This is uh, an early uh, output from them. And within that, they've identified what their current rate of emissions are as, a, as an organisation. Uh, they amount to around about 58,000 tonnes per annum. Um, but they're looking to drive that down that, so that by the, the uh, by their target date of the mid 2030s to reach carbon neutrality, they should have driven that down to around about 32,000 tonnes per annum. But thereafter, it levels out off. That is their residual emissions, which they are going to have to offset. And so they are um, banking on uh, carbon offsetting to the tune of about 640,000 pounds per year in order to reach their, their, their target of uh, net zero. And the question is really, uh, state, you know, they state that they would like to see that expenditure close to home within, uh, within the region. Where could we accommodate that scale of uh, afforestation and that generation of carbon credits to satisfy just one potential investor like the University of Glasgow? And as I, should say, as I say, that's just one of many uh, uh, interested organisations uh, in the climate forest at this moment in time. So, uh, with some funding from Scottish Forestry, we were able to uh, commission Forest Research and the James Hutton Institute to undertake a bit of research just to delve a bit deeper into what the potential is for uh, afforestation within our region and in particular the amount of carbon that might be sequestered through that afforestation. And uh, they based their analysis on what they called uh, forest management alternatives or FMAs. And they, there was a whole range of FMAs, uh, a whole range of different afforestation scenarios, if you like. The one we're looking at here is called multi-purpose uh, broadleaf. It's uh, based on yield class six with moderate thinning, 2.5 meter spacings over 80 years. And uh, the main image there shows you the locations where that uh, type of forestry could be located successfully and the colors represent whether that they would be um, generating carbon or, or locking up more carbon than they generate uh, over the next 25 years up to about 2045, which of course is uh, Scotland's target date for carbon neutrality. So the blue areas are positive and the red areas are negative. So it immediately starts to indicate those areas that we should be avoiding if we want rapid um, locking up of carbon by our target dates. So there we are, that's multi-purpose broadly, but I'll switch it. Oh, I should say that um, based on that analysis, we could estimate that something in the order of about 150,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide would be locked up under that scenario of woodland expansion uh, by 2045. And when you compare that figure, I suppose, to the 11 million tonnes that are being generated currently per year, then that's not uh, great shakes. So we compare that scenario with uh, this scenario, FMA4, which is multi-purpose Sitka spruce, yield cast 12, moderate thinning, two meter spacing over 50 years. You can see that, that we've got much larger areas and much darker blue areas, which indicate that there is a much more rapid locking up of uh, carbon, just the kind of things which we were hearing from Raymond earlier. And when we crunch the numbers on that, it's something in the order of about half a million tons of 
carbon dioxide by 2045. Now, that's significantly more than the broadleaf scenario. But again, it, when you compare that to the 11 million tons per year that's going into the atmosphere, it, uh, tree planting can only be part of the solution, obviously. So that's the opportunity. Uh, this is the challenge. You know, I'm no expert on the wooden carbon code. Um, but, you know, the wooden carbon code could be really important in our efforts to uh, achieve the aims of the climate forest. The challenge for us, for those working for the climate forest, is can we convince landowners to create forests in the right places? You know, we have to bring about uh, an uplift in, in woodland expansion. Can we encourage that? Can we make, bring it about? And will the Woodland Carbon Code be a significant incentive for landowners? You know, this question of additionality is bound to uh, be really important for landowners. Um, they might have heard a lot about the Woodland Carbon Code and the potential for income generation through it, but that may be thwarted if they opt for uh, a highly productive uh, woodland option. And how should we handle the growing demand for uh, high climate forest carbon credits? We're getting a, a, a lot of businesses coming to us and saying we're interested in the high climate forest. What is the opportunity for us to invest in woodlands within our region? And of course, it's very difficult to handle those kind of responses at the moment, particularly when uh, many businesses don't appreciate that it takes time for, tree, time for trees to grow and that pending issuance units aren't necessarily going to give them exactly what they want right now. And then finally, can the climate forest act as any kind of dating agency between potential investors and willing landowners? I'm still trying to navigate what our role will be in this, uh, bearing in mind that there are plenty, plenty within the forestry sector who are doing this kind of work already. So finally, just to say that um, when I talk about the we, the climate forest, uh, it's not just myself and, and my team of, of two officers. But it is uh, including all these other organizations, which you can see on screen just now, that they have all signed up to be uh, helping in the delivery of the climate forest. But crucially, I think we need to recognize that there's a real role for the forestry sector in this as well. There's a, there's a real opportunity, I think, for woodland expansion projects uh, across the UK like the climate forest. And so um, involving um, uh, the forestry sector in this in these kind of pro uh, projects is really crucial, I think. So uh, I'll leave it at, at that, Raymond. There's uh, where you can get more information about uh, the Clyde Climate Forest. We have a, a, an e-brochure which you can see there, which you can download from our, our site, which can give you more information and more visuals. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter or you can contact me on that uh, email address. Thank you very much and sorry for the glitch at the start. Max, you're Max, forgiven. You're forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, now, if I could hand over, please, to Robert Scott Dempster uh, who, uh, of uh, Gillespie McAndrew Solicitors. I, I hope Robert won't blush too much when I uh, say that he uh, has a very long standing uh, uh, involvement in forestry. He's dealt with a huge number of forestry uh, purchase and sales transactions and has a very good understanding of the industry. Uh, he's almost, but not quite, an honorary forester, actually. Still still a lawyer at heart, though, Robert. Thank you very much. Uh, Raymond, that's uh, one of the nicest things anyone's ever said to me. Um, uh, normally, the uh, the lawyer comes in for uh, abuse at this stage of, the, uh, of events, and um, I don't know, can you now see my slides? That's the question. Yes, thanks. Good, excellent. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me to join you uh, this afternoon. It's a great honour and thank you, Raymond. Um, I have been lucky enough to uh, spend some time in the uh, in the forestry world over the course of my career and I uh, have to say it's been some of the most enjoyable experiences I've had. So uh, great to be able to join you today and to talk about uh, the next development that uh, is coming along. Um, and. Uh, Great that uh, Andrew gave us the talk earlier because I think mine follows on hopefully quite neatly because uh, he talked about this whole question of the trading of units. And of course, that's what it all boils down to because it's all very well uh, planting the forests and gaining the carbon units. 
but at the end of the day, if we're going to turn them into money, um, they need to be uh, traded. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon are some carbon contracts and issues that relate to the whole question of the legality that sits around the carbon question and uh, a, a brief touch on the taxation aspects because uh, there are some sort of quite sort of interesting questions there that I think we ought to just have a look at as well. So without further ado, what is the status of the Woodland Carbon Code? And I put the Peatland Code in there as well because obviously that is the other code at the moment that's out there um, which enables uh, people to uh, get this government backed uh, assurance um, that the carbon that has been sequestered is uh, genuinely uh, what it claims to be and tradable. But we'll talk about the Woodland Carbon Code in predominantly and of course it is a voluntary scheme and I think people sometimes ask themselves you know where does it sit in the legal framework and the answer is well it is it is a voluntary scheme which you are eligible to join and uh, 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 Andrew gave us a very clear example of, of what that involves um, and if you join it you play by the rules of that scheme and in essence that scheme the code enables you to to register and verify your carbon units and then uh, you have them and you can deal with them as we'll come on to um, but if you break the rules of that scheme if your forestry doesn't develop if you fail to adhere to the requirements um, then the sanction such as it is is that you can have your carbon units cancelled uh, those that exist that have not already been um, retired and future units will not be verified so essentially the scheme that you've got falls away um, the governance process there is to deal with disputes over interpretation. So if there is a question over how much has been verified, if for example, you anticipated that, uh, let's say that 20 pending units were going to be verified and at the, uh, on the day they only verify 15, you might feel aggrieved about that. You might disagree with what the interpretation is and there is a process within the code to deal with that. But beyond that, there is no other sanction. So there is no overarching person with a big stick that comes along and tells you to do something, you simply just find that you are not verified or your carbon units are cancelled. That is the essence of it. So when it comes to what happens next, which is where do you go with your units, that's really up to you. That's a separate question. And at that point, you've stepped beyond the code. You've now taken the benefit of the uh, of the accredited verified unit that the code has given you, and it's up to you to decide what to do next. And I'm going to keep this quite simplistic um, because there are a multitude of options that are available to you and you can mix and match. But let's just take three different scenarios that um, a landowner might consider um, with the having having gone into one of these, having gone into the Woodland Carbon Code and have units at their disposal. So the first one is that you operate the scheme yourself and you sell the pending units. Um, they don't all have to be sold up front, but clearly that appears to be what is happening and, and we were, that was explained to us earlier. And I think these are the questions that the landowner needs to ask themselves at this point is, you know, what are the risks, what are the positives, what are the negatives in doing this? And indeed, what contracts am I going to have to think about becoming involved in? So looking at the contracts on the left hand side of the slide, there is obviously the carbon sale contract. That's the contract where the the units are, are sold on to the third party purchaser, usually via uh, one of the intermediaries, one of the brokers of the schemes, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, the chances are that your scheme will be run by a project developer who will take uh, responsibility for ensuring that you are all um, accredited, that the scheme is re properly registered, the units are registered and all the relevant uh, requirements of the code are adhered to. So you're going to want some sort of agreement with that individual. Uh, you will, I won't go into the detail, but there are group agreements where different projects can all group together um, and come under so one uh, sort of overarching arrangement. And so the chances are you'll want some form of group agreement. And then last but not least, if you're a landowner and uh, you're, as many of you as forestry managers, your ears may prick up, there will be an expectation of an agreement with you 
And then, of course, the question is, well, what should that agreement say and how much liability is the landowner going to seek to put on to the forest manager, who, after all, at the end of the day, is responsible for making sure that the trees develop and the due um, verifications take place in due course. So why might you go down the route of selling your units up front? Well, the obvious answer is that it's just that upfront money and you've removed the unit market price risk. You've taken your money and uh, that's it. Uh, tomorrow's another day. The minor side of this, of course, is that you have got an ongoing contractual obligation to the third party who's bought those units from you. And that individual or organisation isn't going to sit there and just say, well, that's a shame if those units, those pending units fail to materialise as woodland carbon units. Uh, they will expect some form of redress and you need to work out what extent to what extent you are liable. Uh, if the argument is that it needs to match the price of the units in the market of the day, well, that could be an unlimited liability because if we're to believe Bloomberg, we could be up at £200 a unit. Um, so that could be uh, eye watering uh, uh, level of liability. So where is that limitation of liability going to sit? And that is really the fundamental question that has to be asked if you're going to sell your units up front. And of course, having done that, you still have the bother of the ongoing obligations. You still have to carry on doing all the forest maintenance and meet the requirements of the code so that at the next uh, when the next vintage comes up for verification, uh, you are meeting the requirements. Otherwise, those units won't come through and you'll be in hot water with your third party purchaser. So you've still got to deal with all of that. Clearly, you've got no upside if the unit market price improves. And then, of course, this is, you know, these are 100 year schemes in many cases. So you have burdened a future generation for potentially 100 years. And that's a very significant consideration that people should not lose sight of. Um, you know, once that land is settled into that contractual relationship, how are you going to deal with that? What's the implications of that for the next generation? Because it's all very well if you're in receipt of the money on your watch, but they've got nothing to benefit their generation. They've simply got the obligation. And then you come on to this whole question of the sale of the land to a third party, because it may not be a family member that is sub subjected to this, but you could end up with a, a third party purchaser who's going to who's going to have to accept those obligations. Um, and of course, they will have no benefit. So the implications for land value will be obvious to you. And then there's the potential to restrict future opportunities. And this is where you come into the stacking and the bundling question that was mentioned earlier. You know, we have an awful lot of natural capital accounting that's not yet finalised. We don't know how it's going to go. And there is a risk that if the contract that you enter into is not sufficiently cleverly drafted to make sure that you carve out and reserve back to you as the landowner all those future opportunities, you may be giving away more than you thought. So looking at the alternative use, uh, uh, sorry, the alternative um, uh, route that you might take, which is that you operate the scheme. And in this case, you hang on uh, to your pending units and you either sell them or you use them yourself if you happen to be a business where you need to, to, to uh, offset. And I think the, the technical term is insetting. And in that uh, case, then clearly you are not going to have the third party contract, but you will still have the same considerations for project developer group and forestry manager agreements as you would have had before. Um, and then we should look then perhaps at what the, the pluses and minuses are there. So clearly for the insetting, you're removing the unit market price risk because um, uh, you're not having to go out and buy it. For sale, um, it's a potential unit market price upside um, depending on where the market goes, but equally uh, as we'll see below, it could be a downside. No contractual risk to a third party uh, and the sale of the land to a third party um, will hopefully be seen as a positive because a third party will be buying your land subject to a scheme in which there are likely to be um, opportunities for um, uh, units to be um, uh, verified and duly sold in due course. And obviously one would anticipate you would be assigning your obligations under the scheme at the same time as the sale. The minuses, um, uh, obviously uh, unit market price risk, you still have the ongoing obligations. Uh, the length of the scheme, you're still burdening future generations 
And again, if you're not careful um, and you don't uh, 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 approach this in the right way, there is the potential to restrict future opportunities, um, uh, as I, I lined, uh, outlined a moment ago. So another option might be, and this was again uh, alluded to earlier, which is that you want to push the scheme uh, off your watch completely. So you simply lease the land uh, to a tenant who takes over the whole scheme and runs it completely themselves. So they have the full extent of the risk. Um, you take an upfront premium. Uh, uh, the money that you receive is essentially just a, a capital payment. Um, you have the potential to uh, claim the royalty on the enhanced carbon price if you've managed to engineer your lease correctly, because you would presumably want to give yourself a little bit of opportunity of upside. You don't want to be embarrassed by um, uh, having charged a rent based on or a premium based on, shall we say, today's carbon values, but actually see tomorrow the price go rocketing and you not um, enjoy any of the benefit of that. Um, clearly, you don't have the contractual risk to the third party. You've pushed the problem onto someone else's watch. Um, and you don't have the obligations under the scheme either, because that's, again, the third party's uh, obligation. Uh, the minus is obviously, if you haven't been careful and thought about building in the upside, then you might not get it. Uh, I don't like the uh, possibility of a tenant going bust in these situations. It would leave a mess. You may say, well, you've had your money up front but I believe that the implications for what the future opportunity with that land may be um, could be difficult. There is a statement in the Woodland Carbon Code called the Landowner Commitment, uh, which a landowner has to sign up to when leasing land. And whilst there is no sanction, as I mentioned earlier, under the Woodland Carbon Code, you do need to consider that because I think that there are potential um, contractual implications that third parties might draw from the fact that the landowner has signed up to that commitment and I would always in any lease uh, remove any suggestion that that could be relied upon by third parties. Again the length of the lease removes it from future generations and then there is the potential to restrict future opportunities because essentially if you lease land you have to grant a right of occupation that is an essential tenet of a lease so the occupational right now sits with the tenant and you have to ask yourself, well, have I reserved in that lease sufficient rights back to me as landowner in order to be able to fulfill these other opportunities that may yet uh, come to pass? So again, considerations that um, one would want to have, um, have in mind. So how does that then lead on into the tax question? Um, well, it's obviously very important to know what the tax status of carbon units will be. Um, that, you know, without having given due thought and consideration to that, you would be starting um, uh, w without being properly advised. So the important point to make is that there has not yet been any HMRC guidance on this. And that does create a certain panic in the uh, mind of the tax advisor um, because we are sort of treading into something uh, like virgin territory here. And the question that really we have to ask is, are we dealing with income or capital? Um, the key point here is that income derived from the occupation of commercial woodlands um, is not subject to income or corporation tax um, in the context of uh, the forestry uh, exemption, the capital gains tax exemptions, that is specifically relates to, 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 to timber and to trees. So we are not in a position to obviously fall into that uh, uh, protection. But the question, the, the protection that we're looking to fall into is the income protection. Are we, are we able to treat this as occupation of commercial woodlands? So we then get into the whole question of badges of trade. Um, as to what is and what is not trading um, and the tax position once the nature of the transaction has been determined. So if I could go back to some of the examples that I've just referred to and maybe use them to try and provide some sort of clarity as to the way um, we believe that the uh, taxation of carbon credits uh, might well be might well apply. So take the scenario of the landowner leasing the land to a tenant in return for a chunky upfront premium. Well, the tenant enters into the Woodland Carbon Code. That's their responsibility. Uh, the lease is for more than 50 years. And 
in that context, if it's for more than 50 years, it would be treated as capital and chargeable to capital gains tax currently at 20%. And I'm pleased to say that the budget didn't change that figure yesterday. So the second example um, is where the landowner enters into the Woodland Carbon Credit Scheme, but in this case, sells the pending units up front for a lump sum. They obviously have the ongoing contractual obligations. They have no ongoing income stream. And it's hard in that situation not to feel that that is a capital disposal. And clearly, if that is a capital disposal, it will be subject to capital gains tax. I would contrast that treatment with the sale of the land and the standing timber. And then the third scenario is the one where the landowner enters into the, the, the code, but in this case retains the pending units um, and elects to sell some of these uh, converted carbon credits, these woodland carbon units as they are, woodland carbon units in five years, um, but retains some to be sold when the price is right. And clearly it would seem to me in that case we are looking at some form of ongoing income stream. And given that that is derived from uh, the occupation, and I come on to that commercial woodlands question mark, one would imagine that that would qualify uh, for uh, income tax relief. But I think we have to ask ourselves, and this is the question that we don't really know the answer to, um, what is commercial woodlands? Because if one looks at what commercial woodlands have been considered to be in the past, it would ordinarily be regarded as um, for the long term sustainable production of raw timber and that you'd want to show that there is a proper business plan uh, with design around planting management and ultimately harvesting all for the sale of the, com of the timber at a commercial profit. That is ordinarily what one would have understood commercial occupation of woodlands to mean. But the question is, what is if the only commercial benefit, say in a broadleaf scheme, where there are no other uh, grants or other opportunities uh, for which there is no ambition or expectation of ultimate timber sale? Uh, what if the only commercial benefit is the carbon sequestration? Is that then the occupation of uh, commercial woodlands? And I don't know the answer to that, but we will hopefully get some guidance. And given that the schemes as the additionality test has been explained to us, are looking to move potentially away from Sitka, this could become a very live question indeed. So put simply, the tax treatment of each case is very much fact specific. I would strongly advise you take early advice on structuring uh, in it, when it comes to how these units and the uh, the original plan, when the whole accreditation um, validation is taking place, the tax considerations I do believe need to have been thought out right at that stage. There is the potential uh, for this to be very tax efficient. And last but not least, I would say don't lose sight of the overall inheritance tax position, particularly when you're dealing with larger estates where there are wider considerations and wider property um, elements that need to be brought into play. And thank you very much indeed. Robert, thank you very much. That was, uh, I think, an, an excellent um, a quick gallop through some of the uh, issues that uh, are, are going to definitely affect anyone who is thinking about uh, uh, um, selling or trading carbon units. Um, as, as ever with any long-term uh, uh, agreement um, such as such as this, there are a number of issues that need to be considered, and uh, I think I think you give a, a, a tremendous um, uh, summary of what they what they what they will be. It's 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 not a straightforward situation, that's for certain. Now, if we can move on to uh, questions, then we've had a number of questions have come in. Um, we'll just take them from the top. Um, question for Andy, um, when the WCC refers to the market and what the market desires, how regularly does WCC canvas that market and is that an evidence-based position? 
there are some views that the market is quite content to accept that any that, that a scheme may make financial sense. In other words, be a cash uh, returner and produce carbon credits. And where you do have schemes which are uh, making financial sense by timber uh, sales, for example, uh, these are likely to produce more carbon units at an earlier stage than, say, a native woodland scheme. Yeah, so taking those two points in turn. Um, so first of all, um, our canvassing is relatively limited, to be honest. Um, we do have a lot of conversations with corporate buyers quite often when they're imminently going to buy carbon units from a scheme. They want to make sure that it is credible, that it is this, that it is that. Um, and the feedback we get from project developers who are out in the marketplace far more than we are going to be. So in terms of our canvassing, it is, as I say, it is limited. However, we are, even if to a degree, even if buyers were OK to buy non-additional units, essentially, we still have to adhere to those ICROA principles. So I think it is a balance, um, but as I say, um, there's certainly more work in that area that can be done. And um, I think it's more just a resource issue for us at this point. Secondly, to the latter faster and earlier um, units. So in terms of if you are, I mentioned earlier about the different factors affecting carbon prices and one of them, the primary one is vintage, more so than location. So if a company wants to be more carbon neutral by 2030, that scheme could be in the centre of London, but if those units aren't going to convert until 2050, they don't care, they're not interested in those units. And so conifers benefit significantly from that rapid growth because the way we work out a conifer carbon model we take it essentially as the average amount of carbon stored in that woodland over 100 years so if you had three rotations at 35 years each then we take okay well let's say a thousand tons were sequestered and then it was cut down and then a thousand tons sequestered and cut down we'd say over that 100 years you've sequestered 330 tons of carbon rather than spreading that value over 100 years we put that all within that first rotation so some people argue that that's not not fair on the broadleaf schemes because we're giving the benefit to the commercial schemes so that's how we do it and so yeah conifer schemes are going to be far quicker again those valuable units and um, as described earlier by Raymond if you look at the photosynthetic rate and yield class their yield classes are so much higher and so um, the ability to generate a significant amount of carbon units quickly is certainly an advantage over the broadleaf yeah, uh, th thanks for that. But um, I mean, just as a follow up to, to, to that, um, uh, commercial conifers with a 35 year rotation, uh, they, they are generally going to fall foul of these um, uh, uh, the, the financial uh, financial additionality criteria. So is, is it not is it not almost a, a, a theoretical answer that you've given to that question? Only if you want all of the, you want your cake and eat it, essentially. And this is where I've been pushing really hard to not red list Sitka schemes. Because as I say, there are international standards that say any productive woodlands aren't included. Now, my argument is that the huge benefits of commercial woodlands over non-intervention woodlands. And if you were to say as an investor, OK, we're only going to take 50% of the grant up front. And so that allows us to unlock this timber income. You could still have 80% Sitka. So we're not disadvantaging specific types of schemes in terms of specific species or management regimes. We're disincentivizing hugely economical schemes. And as I mentioned earlier, mixed broadleaf schemes, as you know, Robert was talking about, what is a commercial woodland now? Biodiversity credits, nitrate credits, other sources of income. We include all of that. And so if you had an organization that wanted to claim several different sources of income and carbon units, timber may not be one of them, but we still may say they're not additional. So I know what you're saying. It could be a theoretical argument from me and I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, but all I'm trying to really, really push is that we are not wanting in any way to disincentivize timber producing schemes. We're disincentivizing commercial schemes that would have gone ahead anyway, regardless of where that income came from. OK. Um, it, it's probably uh, pretty closely related to that. The other question uh, was, is strong government support and subsidy for afforestation 
not itself a barrier to demonstrating additionality. And, uh, and this is a supplement to that. Um, uh, given that the government is, of course, extremely keen to demonstrate that it is doing something about climate change and that the planting of trees is always right at the top of their list, I mean, presumably the government will want to see as many uh, um, validated carbon units being produced as possible in order to demonstrate that, the, that, that, that their policies are working. So is there, is there, a, is there a bit of a, a conflict there? So I'm, again, I'm, this is something where I don't want to make any firm statements because I'm not 100% sure, but I am 90% sure that when the government do their national greenhouse gas inventory accounting, they include all woodland creation anyway, within whether it's a carbon code scheme or not, just as they include the emissions from degraded peatlands. And so within their accounting at this point, it doesn't matter to them whether, whether we say that a scheme is part of the carbon code or not, they're still going to account for it. All they want is more woodland creation one way or another. Mm. And so when it comes to a strong government support and subsidy, going back to Sam's question, a barrier, it can be if you want to have all of that grant income. But and I know it's not perfect because I know not all grant schemes are as flexible as we'd like them to be. This is a direction we're wanting to push. Say, let people say I want 80 percent of the scheme or whatever it may be. So I know it's not perfect. But UCO, for instance, in England, they often offer 110 percent of planting costs. How on earth could you say that wouldn't have happened otherwise? This is where income for gone is crucially important. If you're saying I'm already making £150 per hectare from sheep grazing and BPS payments or whatever it may be, but so it's not just is it making a profit in comparison to, you know, is it making a profit at all? Is it making more of a profit in comparison to the existing land use? That's the question we use. And so government grants can um, make it more difficult to pass additionality. But as I say, only if you take the whole grant and only if that grant is so enormous that it's going to be significantly higher than the existing land use. I hope that makes sense. But if not, then yeah. so. Yeah. But it but it does seem that the where, where the government are reporting on uh, on, on carbon fixing, mm -hmm. the question of financial additionality doesn't figure in their in their thinking. It's a moot, it's a moot point for them, really, as I say, because yeah. so long as they can I say that. The fundamental principle is that, as I say, what we're wanting to do is facilitate wooden creation that wouldn't have happened anyway. So in their mind, it kind of is still important because they're wanting to facilitate as much woodland creation as possible. So if we're saying these rules will help stimulate more woodland creation of whatever nature, they're going to be happier with that because they're going to be able to sequester more carbon overall. So from that perspective, Financial additionality is important to them, but with regards to whether it's classed as a formal woodland carbon code unit or not, they don't really care at this point. There, are, there is something called corresponding adjustments that's being discussed at COP26, which may, it's unlikely, but it may say that the government can't claim any, any carbon sequestered through a voluntary market scheme like ours. So if we let all of these, let's say, every single woodland creation scheme in the UK into the carbon code and assigned all of those carbon units and businesses could buy them, if corresponding adjustments are required, which may happen over the next week or two, then the government won't be able to claim any of the benefit of that woodland creation. So these questions are very, very important when it comes to, and that's another, that's, that's when I was talking about the extremes of additionality, that's one of the extremes. And so, yeah, there are a lot of different ways of approaching it. OK, thank you. Um, we have a question from Tim Barrett here. Uh, this might be for, for you, Robert. Will the, will the forward selling of pending issuance units uh, or with the forward selling of pending issuance units, are we building up a legacy of toxic debts for 100 years on those new woodlands and the associated landowners? Well, I think the question of whether they're toxic, uh, it, all depends on the confidence you have in the ongoing uh, quality of the forestry management um, because if the forest is managed uh, uh, as it should be then hopefully the uh, the units will all verify it that, uh, in their respective vintages and uh, th there won't be a problem but tomorrow is another day and we don't we can't see into our crystal ball and we can't see what's going on and you know the point being is is that if you've sold your PIUs 
the next generation have very little incentive um, and it just creates a, a, in my view, a very uncomfortable position for the future generations. I mean, we always have this question about um, when people sell off renewable energy rights but retain the ongoing land. It's always it's always becomes a, a permanent sore. The fact that they have now, even though they have taken their money up front, and therefore the argument is, well, you know, you've had your money. The fact is, is that the the loss of that, that the, the irritation of having it on your on your doorstep, or you know, you you may not like the look of them, uh, and without having an ongoing income stream to sort of make it feel better becomes for many people a, a, a problem. Well, in this case, you've got more than that. You've got an actual obligation to maintain these trees and keep it going. So I, I you know, whether it's quite as uh, toxic is the word I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd necessarily use that word, but I would I would I would cause say pause pause for thought. All I'd say just on the back of that, Robert, as well, and I want to thank you for your presentation. It was really, really interesting to see how you applied it from a tax perspective. Um, but one thing just on the note of ongoing liabilities, you're absolutely right. I agree with everything you've said. When it comes to verifications at year 5, 15 onwards, we're very conservative with our carbon code calculations initially. So if we say we're expecting you to generate 500 carbon units over 100 years, we actually think, and it's included in the carbon calculator now, you can see that we take a 20% haircut, shall we say. So we say, well, we say, we'll, we will give you 500. We expect it's going to be 650, but we'll give you 500 for now. And then as it gets to each verification, if you generate more units, if your trees have grown better than expected, we will give you more units. And the calculator itself is lim very limited. For example, yield class of Sitka, you can only go up to yield class 24. There are yield class 30s, 32s out there, particularly with these improved cell growth stock and stuff. And so if you have a scheme that is planted and managed really effectively, even ongoing um, generations will be able to benefit at each of those verifications. Because as you said, Robert, if the if the price of carbon went from £10 now to £200 in 15 years time or even sooner, those future generations, even if they get another 10 units, they're going to be able to make a decent bit of money from it. So if you manage a wooden carefully and all goes well then those future generations can can also it won't necessarily just be a liability it can because it will be you have to pay for verification and stuff but it can also be an asset and just the final fi you go robert you go robert <laughs> no no i was going to say i agree i mean i think this is about managing this so yes by all means sell a few pending units up front if that's what you want to do but the chance but hang on to some of your woodland carbon units so that you have the ability to genuinely match some of the pending units that you've sold with some woodland carbon units that come into verification at a later stage if that's what needs to happen. Absolutely. And the other point is that the buffering system, which hasn't been discussed today, the complex system, but it is it ultimately does not protect you for pending units. It only protects you for woodland carbon units. Yeah. It is not there because a pending unit is, a you know, it isn't the, no, the government stamp. It does not sit on a pending unit. It only sits on a woodland carbon unit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, again, that's a really, really fair point. And as you say, the buffer is very complicated and it's it, it's important for people to understand its limitations. What I've seen quite a lot of in legal contracts drawn on between buyers and sellers is the seller will often include a force majeure clause within the within the sale. That's quite difficult to do for woodland carbon units, strangely enough, because as you mentioned before, they've already been retired. Whereas if you sell to a company a thousand car pending issuance units, include a force majeure clause, say, look, you're buying natural capital. If all of these burn down, I will replant them as a landowner at my own cost, but you have to accept that whatever level of liability that's fair between two parties, um, that can be included. So it again depends on that legal contract you sign. It, absolutely. And the force majeure, there are force majeure clauses and there are force majeure clauses. Yeah. yeah. Good. Now, I think this this question from Bob McIntosh may have already been answered in the discussion that you've just had on the sale of PIUs and woodland carbon units. But Bob asks, is there a way of ensuring that the money paid for the credits is spread over the life of the project so that on change of ownership, the new owner inherits both liabilities and income? The answer is that the vintage system and the, the, the way in which these are verified over the life of the project, I think ensures the spread of the income and the 
uh, ensuring that the liability is transferred is a matter of the contract that the parties enter into between them when the forest changes hands. So yes, the answer is it ought to be able to transfer so that the party who is taking over the forest, who will have done their due diligence on the forest, the state of the forest and ensure that it is at the standard that it's at and that the previous verification was done without any great problem, uh, ought to then be get comfort that they can take over a forest for which the future income stream can flow to them with a reasonable degree of reliability. OK, thank you. A um, couple of re related questions from Simon McGilvery and uh, Fenning Wellstead. Um, will HMRC question VAT recovery on non-commercial woodlands? And of course, there's been the discussion on what is actually <laughs> what is a commercial and what isn't a co uh, and what isn't. Um, and uh, Fenning uh, said that he thought it was only timber income that was free of income tax and that other incomes were taxable. So uh, his question is, can carbon income be classified as timber? Well, first, uh, on the first question, I'm afraid I'm not going to um, engage, I'm afraid. VAT is um, <laughs> not, not an area that I advise on and I'm not going to place myself um, my neck in that particular noose, I'm afraid. So if you'll forgive me, um, that's out with my competence. Um, the question that Fenning raises is that the issue here is it's not the actual timber itself, it's the occupation of commercial woodlands. Uh, that is, it's income derived from the occupation of commercial woodlands that um, has the relief. And therefore that is how it is uh, possible for carbon, which is part of the income derived from the occupation of commercial woodlands, at least that is the way we are reading it, to be treated as as, as exempt. Um, it is interesting to note that in the Woodland Carbon Code guidance, the uh, it is stated that the sale of units, uh, woodland carbon units, under the government scheme, and this is an in, in the English uh, scenario because that isn't available in Scotland, is is deemed as tax free, which suggests that that somewhere along the line uh, somebody has taken some form of um, advice from HMRC, and that is encouraging because that is after all the sale of a woodland carbon unit, and therefore it has been treated as tax free. So uh, uh, we have a helpful um, precedent, if you like, in that in that in that sphere. But uh, I would say watch this space. I'm sure that HMRC are going to be looking at this very closely. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. Um, David Robertson asks, uh, uh, Andy in particular, have you considered on the basis of schemes which have already been validated, uh, how many of them would now be likely to pass the new financial additionality, additionality test you propose uh, and the impact this might have on the new planting targets across the UK? Um, uh, and if, I, if I could just add to that, I, I, I'm, I'm not clear that that's a new financial additionality test that WCC is proposing. Um, is, is, it, uh, is it better to describe it as a, um, a, a clarification of that additionality test? Um, probably a bit of both, Raymond. I, I guess it, it, the, the rules we're, we're suggesting are new rules, and so it wouldn't be necessarily clarifying the old rules. It would be imposing new rules on new woodlands um, going forwards. But as you say, the financial additionality test has always been there. We're just kind of making it more difficult to pass. Essentially, upon our review, we were looking at these schemes that we knew would have gone ahead anyway and thought there's no grounds under the old rules to be able to reject them. And so these new changes that we're considering are, as you say, it's the same test, but they are new rules. With regards to David's question, um, yes, we have actually done quite a lot of that. First of all, we've done hypothetical scenarios. We did a range of different scenarios, huge range of different scenarios with um, different types of woodland creation scheme, um, different discount rates applied, different purchase prices, income foregone, all of that sort of thing to see what proportion of those schemes would pass or fail. And we realised under the old system, depending on how you played the figures, you could make many, many schemes pass. Whereas the new schemes, we were like, right, okay, it's rejecting the sort of schemes that we would expect to be rejected. With regards to the historical schemes, because the Carbon Code has generally attracted mixed broadleaf schemes over the last 10 years, 
most of them and they don't have alternative source of income because biodiversity credits didn't exist, nitrate credits, that sort of thing. Most of them have passed under the old and the new rules. Over the last year, we've seen several schemes coming through that are 75% sicker and that sort of thing, that the way they've worked their figures, we're actually like, hold on, there's no way we can really reject them based upon this, but under the new rules, they would fail additionality. So we have looked at it with regards to, there haven't been enough schemes to have a decent enough sample size to say 50% or anything like that would fail, um, but it is certainly going to change things. If you're going to be claiming your entire grant and you've got 75% sicker, it is going to be very, very difficult to pass additionality. Okay. Sorry, just the final one with regards to the planting rates across the UK. As I say, our objective is to help facilitate more woodlands going ahead rather than extra funding for the ones that would have happened anyway. So hopefully it will increase the woodland creation rates across the UK. OK, thanks. Um, Sir Tyson asks if there's any experience yet or, or views on the impact on values uh, per hectare after, for woodlands, presumably after selling units or leasing them. Uh, and what if a property is held as security by a bank? I think that's for you, Raymond. <laughs> 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 as, as, as chair, I'm, I think I have to remain neutral. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I think I, I think a large part of this is is, is bound to um, uh, uh, be related to, to uh, what type of woodland it, it, it is, um, whether you have sold PIUs or you are hanging on until they are uh, validated um, uh, uh, units. Um, uh, as, as Robert said, uh, if you if what you are doing is selling on somewhere with a large commitment and no income deriving from that commitment, then it's bound to be a negative on on value. Um, I, I, I can't see any any alternative to that. But quite how much that is going to be impacted, um, I don't think there's enough market evidence out there to to to, to say. I mean. Uh, if if it was a highly productive conifer based woodland on which PIUs had been uh, agreed and sold, then there is clearly still a, 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 a real value there in that woodland. Uh, everyone would be committed to managing that woodland for timber production. So you could argue that the, the, the effect on value might not be that enormous. Uh, if it was a native woodland on a difficult site uh, where, and we all know of some new native woodland projects which have been uh, let's say challenging to get uh, to, to, to get growing um, uh, uh, selling on those types of areas with a large commitment for let's say 100 years that could be a very significant downward uh, uh, effect on, on on value if it's a lease it's all about what the lease says. So if you've let if you've let the land on a long lease, everything depends on what the, uh, for example, have you reserved some form of rights to a, a royalty if the price of the carbon units go up? Well, that would offer value back to the landowner. How far have you reserved the right as landowner to use that land for alternative uses? Have you captured the alternative opportunities that that land might offer sport? Uh, other natural capital opportunities. These, if you've managed to reserve and hold them back, then clearly you've you've retained some value. But given that these are likely to be, you know, the, the length of the lease is going to need to match the length of the project um, for the developer to take it over, for the party taking it over to, to be interested. Um, you know, you are you are into a very long lease, which ordinarily, as we know, would have a m significant devaluation on the land. But as you say, Robert, a, a huge amount will depend on having a well thought through, well constructed uh, uh, set of agreements in place. OK, uh, Craig Dinwoody asks, has anybody questioned the professional liability uh, insurance side of forest managers, agents and consultants providing advice and guidance on the WCC? The risks and opportunities that may or may not be identified and what he says seems like a ticking time bomb of a market. 
It's a really good question. Um, and it is something that I know that I considered back when I was in the private sector saying we need to make sure that we're doing our due diligence and we're providing the right sort of advice to clients. And so our take was generally always to say these are your options and you can make a decision based upon these options provided. But they inherently ask what would you recommend and what what price do you expect carbon will go to? So it's really important, I think, when talking to clients and when anything in writing in particular, that you they're the ones making the decision you're not telling them one way or another the right thing to do quite often when i talk to clients looking at selling all of their carbon units up front that's an option but i'm always i always will try to say but have you considered holding some back as a bit of your own buffer or protection or for the potential increase in carbon prices it's just you have to be very careful i think good but from a lawyer's perspective talking to a landowner the advice that I will be giving is make sure that the agreement you have with your forestry manager in protects you for their negligence or failure if that forest fails to perform and you find yourself exposed to a claim yourself for failure to deliver on the units that you have sold. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is a real question there um, and, and it does need to be addressed. Mm. And from a forestry consultant's manager's point of view, make very sure that you've got good professional indemnity insurance cover. But I, but I, I, I suppose it is something that the uh, PI provider um, it should, should be brought to their, their, their attention. OK, um, question from uh, and forgive me if I get the pronunciation completely wrong here um, from Cathy Carkey. Uh, how do we consider if carbon is locked in the felled Tim timber production scheme producing carbon credits and not burned in a power plant? Yeah, it's an important question, Cathy. It's um, looking at harvestable products, essentially. You know, we are stuck with the carbon that we produce and um, stores carbon for tens, hundreds of years in buildings and that sort of thing. And most importantly, it can displace far and this is the where the real carbon saving comes in if you had a ton of timber you'd store a ton of co2 in that building for 100 years that's great but when it comes to displacing a ton of steel that would have produced 20 tons of carbon that's when the real benefit come in it's very very difficult um to account for that because you're talking 35 40 years in the future so i'm saying comparing it to steel now that material substitution side of things but what if in the future you've got concrete that can suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere faster than the timber ever could. Um, so that material substitution side is very tricky. And again, with the, in, not the embedded, but the, 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 the locked carbon in the timber itself in de in, entirely depends on the use. And so we've seen a huge change in the use of biomass over the last five, 10 years with renewable heat incentives and that sort of thing. And so 20 years ago, no one would have been able to predict the change in timber use and that sort of thing. So that side of things is very tricky. It's more likely, in my opinion, that that'll be something at the end of the cycle. So when you cut it down, you can prove that this is what we're doing and either generating carbon credits there or pr probably more simply just taxing the heavier carbon emitting materials and that sort of thing. So the timber price will continue to rise even faster. When it comes to burning in a power plant, I know AD Forster recently did a paper from Bangor University that was great and it was explaining all of the carbon benefits from timber production. Her scenarios were based very heavily on the development of BEX, the bioenergy carbon capture and storage technology. Now, if that is introduced as hoped, then that'd be fantastic. You can have carbon negative buildings because and carbon negative power plants. Um, but that is an untested and not yet commercially rolled out technology that we'll have to wait and see. So at the minute, we don't consider that. We only consider the carbon that's stored within the woodland, within the wooden boundary. OK, thank you. Um, another another one for you, Andy, from uh, Pauline Cravel. Uh, when the new rules, this, uh, I think this, this will be the additionality rules, are introduced, will they have an impact on projects which are currently registered and under development but not yet validated? Almost certainly. Um, I would caveat that by saying that we are still in the process of 
determining what the rules should be. I've mentioned the possible rules that we're going to be introduced, and I'd say at this point they're almost probable. Um, but we're still waiting on this independent review to come back. It's still based on approval of the executive board, and most likely we'll have to escalate this even higher than within the Carbon Code team quite significantly because we appreciate how enormous an impact these rule changes may have on the market. Um, that will be one of the questions that we ask. What about registered projects? What about projects that are going through validation or haven't yet? However, we decide it, the implementation of the new rules and who or which projects that applies to, they apply to will be a major question. But in all likelihood, yes, it will. Yeah. Can, can you just remind us again, Andy, when when do you think the new rules will be applicable from? So we initially planned on a release at the end of September, and then we were again at the time thinking, OK, well, just like we did about six months ago, we had a rule where we said you were allowed to register a project up to two years after the implementation date, which is the date that planting began. And then as of July 1st, we said so we had a three month lead in and said from this point onwards, any schemes coming to us must register pre-planting. So we'd initially discussed it and thought, OK, well, that seems a sensible sort of thing to do. End of September, you've got three months then to use the old rules, if we say it that way. And then from then on, you have to use the new rules. I'm not confident that it's necessarily going to be like that anymore. It, people may say, right, we're going to introduce these new rules and it's going to, we're going to have a year um, where you can validate under those old rules. Or they may say you've got a week. Honestly, I, I can't say at this point. It's beyond it's beyond my decision at this point. OK, thank you. Um, Cathy Karki again asks, uh, are agroforestry schemes able to apply? Have you had any uptake on farms planting trees? So it depends on whether the scheme can be classed as woodland. So it has to either be 20% canopy cover, 400 stems per hectare to be classed as a woodland. Um, so if the agroforestry scheme can be classed as that, don't quote me on this because I'm not particularly au fait with agroforestry schemes, but I do think that they can be included so long as they meet our criteria because agroforestry schemes differ enormously between the four countries. And so, um, so yeah, I think they can be included. Just as an aside, the Natural England Investment Readiness Fund, NERF, is recently sporting five new carbon standards and their development, including um, salt marsh carbon, rewilding, hedgerows and soil carbon and farming carbon. And agroforestry is one of those, that, not agroforestry quite, but there's a very blurred line between what's a forest and what's a, uh, what's a farm. And so um, they're looking into all of those as well and what is technically should be within our remit. So the minute, I think so, but it depends on the agroforestry scheme. OK. Um, but have you had, do you know whether any agroforestry schemes have been registered under the WCC? No, I don't know. Um, I think they have, but I'm not 100% sure. So I don't say definitively. Yep, understood. OK. Um, David Edwards asks, uh, is there any pushback on the international regulators on the additionality criteria? Yes, and there always is. Um, when the uh, so solar panels and wind turbines, hydroelectric power, that sort of thing used to be um, eligible for the generation of carbon units in the UK. As far as I know, uh, this is my basic understanding. Now, their units were reduction units in terms of as a coal power plant, you emit a thousand tons of carbon annually. You put in a solar farm and reduce the need for that by a thousand tons you can generate 1,000 reduction units annually. Now we're removal units, which are seen internationally as a better type of unit because we draw out of the atmosphere. But because the increase in solar panel um, uh, viability in the UK, it meant that there was a point, I think it was about three or four years ago, where the international standards, ICRA and the like, made a, um, made a decision to say, okay, in Annex 1 countries, in the developed countries, essentially, you cannot now generate carbon credits from solar, wind or hydroelectric. Obviously, the pushback from that was enormous, but there's only a very, very small. They still pushed it through and this is now the international consensus and that everyone has to adhere to. Now, don't get me wrong, a solar developer in the UK could claim that there are carbon benefits, but they won't be a crower endorsed and they won't find any buyers because of that lack of endorsement. Um, 
So yes, I'm certain that there will be pushback on additionality in all its forms, um, but I think the international consensus is just pushing it along to make sure um, it's, it's, it's moving faster than the pushback will. The pushback won't stop it, basically. It's going to happen. OK. Um, another question for you, Andy. You're, <laughs> you're, you're, uh, you're getting lots of them here. Um, do you have a minimum number of carbon credits? This is from Tom Astor. Do you have a minimum number of carbon credits generated per year required to make the WCU market scale and liquidity viable to institutions and businesses? Uh, we need to offset circa 90 million tonnes in 2050. How much of this can come from WCUs? And this actually kind of plays into the, our, not our favour, it's the wrong way to describe it. The first thing that companies need to do is reduce their emissions down enormously. We're talking about the last 10% of emissions that they literally can't do anything about. That's all we want people to have to offset. Um, or companies that are wanting to actively become carbon negative, and so they're sequestering more carbon than they're emitting. Uh, but you know what I mean, then, then they possibly could. Um, and so with regards to how much of that can come from the UK Woodland Carbon Code, first and foremost, trees take time to grow. So by 2050, yeah, we could have a decent pool of carbon units, but even at 30,000 hectares a year, it's still going to fall quite significantly short of generating that number of carbon units and carbon re emission reductions to do that. So I'd say first and foremost should always be that push to um, to reduce emissions. In terms of scalability, we have seen an enormous increase in registrations and validations under the code. Um, last, I think just to, I, th I think first 10 years, we had the equivalent number of registrations as we did the year 2020, 2021, financial year 2020, 2021, and we're significantly exceeding that number of, of registrations again this year. So the increase in the number of, in the interest in the carbon code is enormous. So even if we were to capture all 30,000 hectares within the carbon code, no, we wouldn't have the capacity to <laughs> offset 90 million tonnes, but the, the, the scale is definitely increasing rapidly. Okay, thanks for that. We, seem to have run out of questions and we've got five minutes uh, five minutes in hand so excellent timing <laughs> um, uh, jimmy do you have anything else to say before i move on to the the the, the, the thanks and uh, um uh, and closing up the meeting uh, thank you raymond i would just um like to appeal to the um forestry agents in the audience at the moment to pay particular attention to one of the slides in my uh, in in my report and my update um, relating to the, the situation of the 2020 claim year at the end of august and I, these figures will now be out of date but at the end of august um, some 850 hectares had still not been claimed and um, Scottish Forestry were still looking at uh, what should have been over a thousand hectares of woodland which couldn't be completed in time for uh, the uh, 31st of March this year and were being rolled over into the next year. And so there's a particular request from uh, Scottish Forestry to, uh, if you are dealing with that sort of um, business, can you please um, move it on as quickly as possible? Thank you, Raymond. Okay. Thank you. Um, right, if I could maybe just uh, uh, finish up then. Um, could I, on behalf of everyone who has taken part in this meeting today, give really sincere thanks to Andy, Marks and Robert for what were three very, very interesting uh, uh, and, uh, and, and useful presentations. Um, could I again thank the industry leadership group and Scottish Forestry and Jamie, uh, you for doing all the organisation of this. And, uh, and most of all, if I could uh, thank everyone who has actually taken part in the, in the meeting. Uh, thank you again. Um, Next meeting is scheduled for the Mid Scotland uh, on the 23rd of March next year, Jamie. 
Uh, that's correct. Yeah, we're going to have um, the 9th, 16th and 23rd of March for the, the regional meetings. And uh, I'm obviously hoping that um, we'll be able to meet up by that stage. OK, um, so if anyone has any suggestions at all um, for, for topics for, uh, for, for these meetings, do please feel free to make contact either with Jamie or uh, myself or any of the members of this, uh, the, the, the steering group. Um, and uh, uh, the, the steering group does does meet in advance of, uh, of these meetings to agree topics and uh, and try to press gang speakers into <laughs> into giving presentations. Um, so thanks very much again to, to, to everyone. Uh, have a happy Halloween when it comes and uh, and let's 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 hope we uh, we're not in lockdown for Christmas this year. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.